Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Dr. Alice Lee. I'm the Director of Secondary Education for the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District. Tonight, we have a wonderful parent webinar here from our friends at the Los Angeles County of Education with Derek Reed, Mark Hernandez, and Linnell Lujan. So I will now pass it over to you. We're going to be talking about youth vaping. And so take it away, team. All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Lee. And yes, if you are in the right place, you are here for the Youth Vaping Webinar for the Palos Verde Peninsula Unified School District. And my name is Derek Reed, and I'm with the Los Angeles County Office of Education's Tobacco Use Prevention Education Unit. And also on the call today, I have my supervisor, Mark Hernandez, our program coordinator, and our other senior program specialist who is in charge of the Department of Justice grant, Linnell Lujan. And I'd like to take a small moment to honor and thank Ms. Lujan for putting together a majority of the slides and resources that you will be seeing this evening. And with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started with today's agenda which will start with a grounding activity. If you could, please just take a few deep breaths. Just want you to relax. Go ahead and breathe in through your nose. Release that breath out through your mouth. And as you're taking those deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth, I want you to take yourself back to a time back to a time where some of you are like, no, I don't want to go, but take yourself back to when you were in school, right? And take that one last deep breath and release it and take yourself back to a time before the cell phone. Yes, believe it or not, there was a time before the cell phone. I remember when I was in high school, I had a pager and I knew that when my mom texted me on that pager, if were there even texts back then? I think you had to pay for those <laughs> by the text. But when I got that page, I knew I better give mom a call or I was going to be in trouble. So I wanted to thank you for participating in our grounding activity. I think it's important that we're able to relax, really settle into today's webinar and be present as we go through our slides together. So I like to start with breath because our breath, our mind and our bodies are life's free coping mechanisms, are tools that big tobacco is trying to hijack slowly and take away from us. Because when we can't breathe, breathe, how can we regulate our mind and our bodies to do the things that we need them to do to release that free dopamine? So cell phones in many ways have become the new backpack and in some cases can also serve as an addiction. As parents, safety and use is always a great place to start a conversation with your youth when it comes to cell phones, and drug use. So let's get started with our first topic this evening, youth vaping. So the National Youth Tobacco Survey taken in 2022 states that more than 2.5 million high school and middle school students currently use e-cigarettes, which means more than one in four use e-cigarettes daily, and the most commonly used device types are disposable. And we're gonna learn a little bit later that these disposable devices, although that they are marketed as disposable, are not to be thrown in the trash can. To continue, almost 85% of these e-cigarettes that are being used have some sort of flavoring in them. Also, the 2022 findings suggest that current use of the 2.1 million equaling to 14.1% of high school students and 380,000 are, uh, which equals to 3.3% of middle school students are currently using these types of devices. When it comes to frequency and use, more than a quarter of these students, equaling to 27.6% of current youth e-cigarette users use an e-cigarette product every day. 
So more than four in 10 youth e-cigarette users report using e-cigarettes at least 20 out of the last 30 days. That is a lot of days. So current tobacco product use among high school students. By the CDC, we've learned that 16.5% are using any type of tobacco product, 14.1% use e-cigarettes solely, 2.8% are using cigars, 2% cigarettes, 1.6% smokeless tobacco, 1.5% are using hookah, 1.4% the nicotine pouches, and 1.1% are heated tobacco products, and 0.7% are using pipes. The National Youth Tobacco Survey of 2022 for more than 3 million students currently using tobacco products, almost 1 million use multiple or more than two tobacco products. E-cigarettes are the most commonly used tobacco product and about 1 million youth use a combustible tobacco product, meaning like the old school cigarette or cigar or pipe. The most common reasons for youth by the National Tobacco Survey as of March 2021, 43.4% use these products because they say, I'm feeling anxious, stressed, or depressed. 42.8% say that they use these products to get high or from the buzz that they receive from the nicotine. 28.3% say, I use it because my friend uses them and 20% say I use them to do tricks. Now this might reference or be referring to like the smoke rings and all those types of things that they are doing with the tricks and the amount of vape, supposedly vape, that they are able to use to blow all these different types of rings into different shapes. So which students are more likely to vape? This slide would suggest from the Cal, uh, the Cal West, the, Na the Hel California Healthy Kids Survey, that students who are suffering from chronic sadness, suicide ideation, and emotional distress are more likely to use a vape product opposed to those students who may have more of a mindset uh, that their life is more having a life of a positive and having more satisfaction in their life are less likely to use a vape product. And you'll see on the next slide that this data trends over to marijuana use as well, which we see again that chronic sadness, suicide ideation, and emotional stress, the numbers are higher for the use of marijuana as opposed to those students who have more of a life satisfaction and are more cup half full or optimists about their life and their current situation are less likely to use marijuana. So let's take a deeper dive into the California Healthy Kids Survey for Palos Verde Peninsula Unified School District. So in a nutshell, the target sample for seventh grade as a whole was 745 students. Of those 745 students, 669 students were surveyed for a response rate of 90%. And you can continue on by seeing that we had an 82% response rate from ninth grade, 11th grade received a 78% response rate, and then non-traditional schools, a 100% response rate. Just note that on the next few slides, the, that data will not include the non-traditional schools. And I'd like to bring your attention to just a small little piece of this table because out of the 934 students, just bear in mind that 730 of them were surveyed. So you could kind of keep that in your head as we move through the following slides. All right, so current vaping. So when students were asked, in, were they using a vape product of either marijuana, of a wax material, or any kind of a juice or a nicotine type of vape product? So vaping in general, once or more in the last 30 days, we have found that seventh graders reported 1%, ninth 
ninth grade reported 3% and 11th graders reported 12%. Now, when we just focus solely on tobacco vaping itself, excluding marijuana vaping devices, you'll notice the numbers change just a little bit. You see seventh grade reporting 0%, ninth grade students within the PVP Unified School District reporting 2% and 11th graders reporting 10%. Now just keep in mind this is just vaping tobacco products alone in the in, once or more in the last 30 days. The data continues with uh, asking the students in the past to 30 days, once or more, have you smoked a combustible or old style type of cigarette? And you can see the data is trending that old style types of cigarettes, combustible cigarettes, students are not smoking these like they used to. So seventh graders report 0%, ninth graders 0%, and 11th graders at 2%. Current marijuana use once or more in the last 30 days, seventh graders reported 0%. Now keep that total in mind as we, before we move to the next slide, but seventh graders reported 0% of marijuana use in the last 30 days. Ninth graders reported 3%, and 11th graders reported 13% having used marijuana one time or more in the last 30 days. Now, why I drew your attention to the seventh grade number is because when you look here, when the students were asked, have you currently vaped marijuana once or more in the last 30 days, you can see that the seventh grade population now states that they have at least 1% have vaped marijuana one or more times in the past 30 days. Ninth graders have vaped marijuana uh, at, at a 2% at least once or more in the last 30 days, and 11th graders at 7% for having vaped marijuana one or more days in the last 30. So when you change the question as to, did you just smoke marijuana or did you vape it? The answers and the data changes by changing the question. So other alcohol, alcohol or other drug use, this would entail all the different types that are out there currently being used. One or more times in the last 30 days, seventh graders at a 3%, ninth graders at a 9% and 11th graders for alcohol and other drugs at 25%. So I tell you all of that to bring you to this next slide, which discusses something called the triangulum. And that really just is a model to let others understand that it is a framework for how all of these three different uh, either it be tobacco, vaping, or marijuana, go hand in hand and are connected to each other. So some might start smoking cigarettes, some might start smoking marijuana, some might start with a vaping device. Maybe it's not even one that is containing tobacco or marijuana itself. Maybe it has some kind of um, a vitamin, so to speak, or something like that, but it's still containing a vaping device, which may lead that student to start smoking a nicotine vape or a marijuana vape later on in life. And you'll notice that whether you are male or female, the data here on the right hand side of this slide would suggest that from 2009 to 2019, whether male or female, the, the amount of use between both genders is starting to level off. When it did begin that males were using these devices more, but as you see now coming into 2020, 2017 and 2019, that both are almost about the same in and around Los Angeles County. So let's talk a little bit about Vaping 101 and what are these devices and kind of how do they work 
And so a device used to simulate the experience of smoking, having a cartridge with a heater that vaporizes liquid instead of burning it. And I frown on myself for using that term vaporize, but that's what everybody kind of understands. That's the coined word that goes along with a lot of these products. But soon you're going to all already know, if you don't already, that these devices are creating not a vapor, but an aerosol. And you can kind of break them up into the following few categories. And we're going to do a deeper dive here on each one of them. So you have your e-cigarettes, your vape pens, your mods, your tanks, and jewels. So what are e-cigarettes? They all have to have a battery. There's some kind of absorbent material within these e-cigarettes and you need an atomizer or a coil which will create the nicotine aerosol. So all three of these components are necessary to create the nicotine aerosol. And you can see that here in this wonderful infographic and in this absorbent material or cotton. And I like that we use this term absorbent material because it can be made out of different things that want out of different materials that once burned up and, and, and they don't quite mesh well with the human body. And it's it's. The cotton sometimes also will get completely burnt away and the user begins to actually smoke the inner coil and sometimes that can be something made out of a plastic or a styrofoam and um, it doesn't pose well for the human body at all. All right, so I'm not sure how many of you are following along as of right now, but I would like to just take a moment, you can take a look at this slide here at this picture here on the left and how many vaping devices do you think that you can pick out of this picture on the left right i'm gonna pull the chat up and see and if you were able to select just hidden in all of these different school materials you would see that there are not just one two three but four vaping devices within this picture alone and so that's why we like to say it's it's very hard sometimes to identify the odor or the aerosol because it's not a vapor, right? It's not like a cigarette that when we lit it up or when someone was smoking around us, we our nose would immediately tell our brain, uh-oh, somebody's smoking a cigarette. Where is that, right? Or let me walk away because I don't want that to go into my body. So vape aerosols are either odorless or they smell like some kind of a sweet flavor, which is also talked about as the e-juice. And vapes are small and they're easily concealed. And instead we need to be looking for these telltale signs or symptoms when we think that maybe our youth might be using or thinking about using. So some of the things that you can look for are finding an unusual or unfamiliar items in your student or your youth's backpack or their room, or if you're um, asking and looking around and, and check, seeing what uh, platforms they are, they socialize on on social media and the things that they're, they're interacting with can also assist you as a parent to see and begin to have those conversations with your youth about these types of products and the harm that they can cause, not just for themselves, but for your family as well. So to continue on, there's also the sweet fragrances. You may see a change in behavior and or mood. You might see some drowsiness, some coordination issues, some issues with attention, memory and learning, and possibly some bloodshot eyes. I also like to mention, are they taking a lot of breaks during family time? Are they walking away a lot or going into the home restroom maybe or outside quite often and then coming right back in? That might be a great opportunity to have a conversation and, and, and see why they are needing to walk away so many times when it's possibly family time. All right, so top e-cigarette flavors among youth who use flavored e-cigarettes. And this, of course, again, was taken from the National Youth Tobacco Survey of 2022. So amongst all of these types of, of, of e-cigarettes that are being used, 84.9% in 2022 of the youths who are currently using e-cigarettes 
69.1% used some type of an e-cigarette that contained a fruit type of taste and possibly smell. 38.3% used an e-cigarette that had a candy or sort of a sweet, uh, maybe like a chocolate uh, attached to it and a smell. You had mint coming in at 29.4% and menthol at 26.6%. So e-liquid ingredients, of course they contain nicotine, excuse me, artificial flavors, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. Now, I wanna take a moment to talk about the artificial flavors. We're gonna get a little bit more into that on the next slide. But that term artificial flavoring, we already know in some of our other products like food and things of that nature that some of these artificial flavors are not good for the human body. And they don't necessarily tell us which ones they are. So on the back of a lot of these nicotine e-juices, you might see some of these ingredients listed, right? But once these ingredients are heated up and or aerosol, if you will, you then have what's called a chemical reaction, which changes the components of the e-juice into several other things. And I'm gonna give you a few of those right now. So base, ingredients right propylene glycol 30 percent grade vegetable glycerin and of course as we mentioned before and even this one goes a little bit further saying natural and artificial flavoring at 30 percent and that's also something to question too because what are these natural flavors they don't always tell us on the backs of our products and once these products are heated up you will see that these types of ingredients begin to arrive. And these are compounds that you're going to see in a moment. They are going to appear in yellow from these lists. And all of these listed below are from the FDA's 2012 harmful and potentially harmful substances established list. I'd like to draw your attention to some of these. As we know, nicotine, you can see xylene, benzene, for those of us who used to dissect uh, in science class, you might remember those frogs or those pigs and they were dipped and housed and preserved in formaldehyde, which can also be found in a lot, if not all of these e-juices and vape um, waxes. And of course, lead and your other, uh, where is that? And your other uh, heavy metals. So current e-cigarette users overall. So this was a question that was taken from the National Youth Tobacco Survey of 2022. And it asked students, what were the most popular brands out there that, that students were using, youth were using right now? And surprisingly, they gave them an opportunity to write some in. And you'll notice when we go through this, that, so that Jewel doesn't even make the cut when it comes to what students are into right now, when it comes to their preference of what type of vaping device that they want to use. So the top five coming in with 14.5% is the Puff Bar. You have Vuz coming in at 12.5%. You have the uh, hide coming in at 5.5, smoke at 4%, and once again, Juul doesn't even make a percentage. And then you have 21.8% of some other brands. And the 21.8% is because there are so many new types of these devices coming in all the time that it's hard for a lot of folks to keep up and stay current with what everybody is preferably smoking. And a lot of times with our youth, we will see that since they don't have access and they're really not supposed to be purchasing these products, that they might get something from overseas or from a second market or a black market or something like that, where the chemicals and things inside are even regulated even less and the components inside can be even more dangerous. All right, so here are a few of the different types of vaping devices out there that your youth may um, have interacted with or might see. And you have the closed pod system, 
These will have their own particular pods that you will place inside. And then once the nicotine pod is complete, you would take it off and throw it away. And then you could place a new uh, pod in them. You have an open refillable system, which you can put your own juice flavoring in. And once done, you can fill it up with something else. And many of these can be recharged. You have your disposables, which is very popular right now with youth. And this one here is the puff bar coming in many, many different flavors. I believe this one is pineapple lemonade. And then you see mango, frozen mango. Uh, what is this? We have the Uno bar also coming in uh, with their own flavors like mango ice and air bar as well. And then, of course, you have your flume. And just for as an example of what's really inside and the amount of nicotine that can be inside a lot of these devices, let's take a look at the flume here just for a moment. This flume pebble contains 14 milliliters, which is an equivalent of 5% of nicotine liquid or about 700 milligrams of nicotine. So let's think about that in comparison to a cigarette, which literally just delivers one milligram of nicotine each. So within that one orange flume pebble, they call it pebble as to say it's small, right? But it's housing 700 milligrams equaling about 700 cigarettes. This slide really illustrates who are these vaping companies marketing to and many of these other brands that who, who are they marketing to when they need to make these contraptions to hide it or conceal it and you can see the young lady in the middle who is using an a mercedes-benz car key fob as she's mentioning uh, to vape with you'll notice here on the left there is a sharpie that's been converted into a vape We've even seen inhalers, uh, which is very sad considering, you know, most people who are using an inhaler may have some sort of a lung or breathing uh, problem to begin with. Then you also see on the right hand side, a pen, a cup, a lipstick and a vape watch. And if you were to take a deeper dive, there are some clothing brands out there like vapeware, which make hoodies with little strings where you can put it in your mouth that's already connected to a battery within the clothing. Once again, to conceal and make it harder for us as parents, as administrators, teachers to locate and see who is actually using uh, on school campuses or at home. So let's talk a little bit about social media, right? Because the cell phone, as I mentioned before, has sort of become in many ways the new backpack. And I know that a lot of parents sometimes are saying to themselves, ah, that's a privacy issue I shouldn't do. I shouldn't really be, you know, trying to, I should allow my student to, or my, my youth to have their cell phone. But I always tell parents when trying to engage youth or your child, when you start with the conversation from a place of safety, your family's safety, and in a calm and open manner, students are really, and your youth are really open to listening. So I always talk about safety first. So on social media right now, of the one in four children who have seen drugs for sale on social media, 56% saw drugs advertised on Snapchat, 47% saw drugs advertised on Facebook. 55% saw drugs advertised on Instagram. Of the one in four children who have seen drugs for sale on social media, 63% have seen cannabis, 26% have seen cocaine, 24% have seen M MDMA or ecstasy, 20% Xanax, 17% nitrous oxide and 16% codeine. And this doesn't even include the other platforms that we know our children, our youth, our students are on such as gaming platforms and of course, TikTok. And I'm, I'm assuming they will be more, right? So let's talk a little bit more about the equivalent or the amount of nicotine within these devices. Relatively quickly, there are 20 
uh, cigarettes, you get 20 milligrams of nicotine. In a Juul pod, there are 41.3 milligrams of nicotine, which is the equivalent of 41 cigarettes. In the puff bar, which I mentioned earlier, which is very popular with youth right now, you will have 50 milligrams of nicotine, which is the equivalent of 50 cigarettes per puff bar. In one of these Soren pods, there are 90 milligrams of nicotine, which is the equivalent of 90 cigarettes. And those are these smaller devices. And as these devices get better and get stronger, we are seeing that they are able to contain more and more nicotine in smaller and smaller devices. So the big bar has 2,200 puffs each, which is the equivalent of 220 cigarettes. The pop hit flex, 3,000 puffs, 300 cigarettes. The flume, 4,000 puffs, 400 cigarettes. One of these mega puffs is 5,000 puffs each and it's 500 cigarettes. And one mega puff is 10,000 puffs each, and it's 1,000 cigarettes. So in the grand scheme of things, you have three kind of separate categories when it comes to these vaping devices and when, it, when it's pens. You have your vape pens, your wax pins here in the middle, and then your dab pins on the right. And these will contain your cartridges on the right, which you see at the top right where the wax pin and wax is a term used for the material inside of these cartridges that contain the liquid if, um, THC. We're gonna get a little bit more in depth in the dab pins in just a moment. So let's talk about aerosoling or vaping, right? THC concentrate is aerosolized. It takes about five to 10 seconds to feel the effect. The high lasts about 30 minutes to several hours. And the THC concentration really just depends on the liquid. And that liquid is usually often mislabeled. Let's talk about the old school type of, of ways to uh, receive uh, cannabis, which was smoking or pipes and bongs. So a joint is a cannabis flower and thin paper made from rolling of rolling cigarettes. A blunt is a cannabis flower that is rolled into a cigar, cigar tobacco leaf. A spliff is a combination of tobacco and cannabis flower wrapped in a thin paper. Pipes, of course, are where the cannabis flower is burned and smoked and inhaled. You have the bong, which is the cannabis flower burned and smoked and is cooled through water and then inhaled. And all of these take about five to 10 seconds to feel the effect. The high lasts about 30 minutes to several hours and the THC concentration once again depends on the cannabis inside dabbing. So it is a concentrated THC wax that is heated directly onto a coil, all right? And the aerosol is then inhaled. This takes five to 10 seconds to feel the effect. The high can last 30 minutes to several hours. And the, the user is now getting 80%, at least 80% THC concentration. Now, this is the method where you can see a lot of students or users associated with having to go to the emergency room. But we are seeing a lot of dabbing going on because students are getting so addicted that they uh, and accustomed to some of the lower level uh, THC that to get high again, they have to have stronger amounts. And last but certainly not least, you have your edibles. And these are cannabis infused drinks and foods. And these take about 20 minutes to two hours, depending on your body's um, digestive system, what you've had to eat that day. And these highs can last typically for hours. And the THC concentration is always going to vary. And it's never really measured accurately. And honestly, a lot of students, at least in my experience as, as a school administrator, we would see students who would take a little bit, or there would be a student who had something on campus, it was given out somehow, and students would take a little, they're thinking, this isn't kicking in yet, then they take some more, still not working, 
then they take a little bit more and now it's working way too much and they're starting to have an anxiety attack in their class or wherever they are in the school day. And then usually, of course, an ambulance is called uh, to assess that student. And you'll see here in this picture that these types of edibles are using packaging and brand names, but changing them just a hair uh, so that they are relatable, noticeable, and students want to use them because these are products that they've grown up with. You see that you have the Stonio in place of the Oreo. On the flip side, though, most youth uh, who are you or do not use, sorry, let me, let me say, say that slide one more time, because this is a good one. Most youths who currently use tobacco products are not daily users. And that is a, that is a good piece of information. So most youths are not using these products. 66% of high school students and 88.7% of middle school students have never used a tobacco product. But why? Why do young people still take health risks? Well, their brains, of course, are still developing. And there are three big categories as to why a student, your child, might take a health risk. Those can be personal, interpersonal, and social slash environmental, which could be the community in which they live. So what can we do? What can we do? You can educate yourself. Take a look at Penal Code 308. Check out the harmful effects on the body. And you definitely want to investigate your school district's policies, the interventions that they offer, and the disciplinary steps that they may take as well uh, in the instance your student or child uh, decides to use uh, while at school. Two. Absolutely. Talk to your child, ask questions, provide answers, share anecdotal stories and experiences that you've gone through and build that connection and tear down that wall between yourself and your child. And always, as I mentioned before, have those uh, those those triumphant conversations, those transformational conversations about scary topics such as the cell phone, internet use, social media, and of course, the temptation to use vaping products. Seek help and resources from family, your school, and of course, your community. And for if you want to take some action, I definitely recommend you do so. You could join such organizations as PAVE, which stands for Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, and you can go and vote on policies or get a ban policy started or initiative started within your local community by going to your local, um, your local city council and things like that to get the ball rolling. Uh, those participating in this webinar and afterwards will have access to this amazing resource folder housed on Google. And I believe if I click here, it should just take me directly there. Perfect. Uh, which will have a numerous amount of resources and handouts. It has an e-cigarette brochure, how to talk to your kid, if you discover, if you suspect, or if you think your child's using some ways to talk to them, some more information from the National Youth Tobacco Survey of 2022. We even have some resources in Spanish available for you and how to talk to your teen about vaping, how to protect your child from e-cigarettes, um, six steps to talking with your child about alcohol and other drugs, some more, we're going to get into this one here in a second, some language and dictionary terms that students are, and youth are using. So when you hear these buzzwords, you can start to think, oh, let, let me ask my, my child what they mean by using that word. Uh, some more vaping facts and some, how the vapes work. You can do a deeper dive as well. And then, of course, some more facts and some misnomers about the youth in, in the United States of America and their use of e-cigarettes, and of course, what you need to know about vaping. Go back here to my presentation. So as I mentioned before, the vaping lingo, this slide deck will be shared uh, out uh, with Palos Verde 
Peninsula Unified School District. And as I mentioned before, it will help you to discover certain words that youth are using like ghost and ripski to um, these devices that might resemble USB flash drives that youth the vaping epidemic has introduced a number of terms and phrases and some discrete devices that can make it difficult for us adults to keep up. I thought I was cool. I still think I'm cool, but sometimes I got to go and do a deeper dive because I don't know some of these words. There will be some links here for you for the uh, Parents Against Vaping e-cigarettes toolkit. Uh, how how to fight the flavoring of these e-cigarettes, some organizations on how you can get involved as well. The Rethink Vape on how to talk to your teen about vaping. Of course, a lot of these are housed in that Google folder I showed you prior. And you will also be receiving, uh, we're going to be giving uh, this handout to Palos Verde Peninsula Unified School Districts so that they can hand it out to parents that are interested in learning more about vaping and how that they can protect their child from the vaping epidemic. And it will give you all the QR codes to Parents Against Vaping e-cigarettes, the Truth Initiative, Kick It California, which is a state funded uh, quitting and a quitting uh, initiative, uh, which in a cessation, which can help yours and it's free, which will which your student can use either by a texting or actual on the phone counseling. And then of course, how to talk to your teen about vaping and the resource folder I showed you earlier. So what is the Palos Verde Peninsula Unified School District already doing? So in high school and middle school in the seventh grade, they are using what's called the Stanford Tobacco Prevention Toolkit, which is an evidence based and theory based uh, curriculum on tobacco and vaping prevention and in seventh grade your student would should be receiving about five sessions um, throughout the school year in and around uh, certain topics to keep your student from using these types of products and then also in high school from ninth through twelfth grade they'll receive eight sessions on the, from the same uh, tobacco prevention toolkit, but at a high school level version, uh, also helping to keep your student from using these vaping products. Also, we have social emotional learning, which is occurring from fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, eleventh grade, which your student might be receiving anywhere from thirty to thirty-eight different sessions. Intervention services include certain things like healthy futures. Um, which would your student might only participate in if they were observed using some of these products during the school hours or at a school function. And there's also some peer to peer programs that are offered in and throughout uh, the PVP Unified School District to help students support one another in the instance they are uh, using some of these products. You have cessation referrals, as I mentioned before, to Kick It California. Next year, the Palos Verde Peninsula Unified School District will be invited back again to our LACO produced Youth Advocacy Leadership Conference. And there'll be some flyers coming out for that next school year, which is a fun filled day of interactive and engaging uh, breakout sessions from reputable organizations all over the state of California and in sometimes uh, the United States. And then, of course, a great keynote session and students are able to engage and interact with one another from in and around Los Angeles County. There will be some assemblies that are always provided by PVP, at least one to sixth through eighth grade in and around this subject matter guest speakers also coming to the school sites that are vetted and will be speaking in and around these topics and then grant activities like this one parent and community engagement and then of course we always want to make sure that the staff is also trained with the latest and greatest in and around this work and that will also take place at least once a year every school year I just want to thank you so much for spending some of your evening with me. I know family time and your evenings are very important. Time is our most valuable resource. So thank you very much. And I will stick around for just a moment. And this does conclude our webinar for this evening. Thank you very much.